you had said that it, the Lord put freedom on your heart. Um, and we're in this series, uh, if you haven't been here with us, on the ecclesia. And that just means the church. What does it mean to be the church? And there's all different ways of looking at the church. And so today, if we're a people that we're called out, that's what ecclesia means, to be called out. So, you know, in the book of Acts, it's the people on the way. But I want us to think about um, the whole idea of freedom because um, of the way God, uh, and the way Paul, or God through Paul, uh, tells us, um, kind of tells us our identity. What we need to do, so, so in the Old Testament, Sabbath was about covenant renewal. And so all that meant was every seven days, you need to kind of retell the story. You need to maybe come at it from different angles to refresh and remind your hearts and minds, you know, who you are. And we, if you take the concept of freedom and you take it, it, this is Orphan Sunday, right? What does it mean for you if God, if we believe everything is in the providence of God and you're here and the reason you're here, it's not a mistake and you're supposed to be here on this Sunday and we're supposed to learn about freedom and I want, well, I, I want you to think about freedom in the context of the gospel, but uh, we're going to start with Ephesians 1, 4, and 5. We're going to jump around a little bit today to get some pictures of how God wants us to see ourselves. Because maybe we have a jaded view. Maybe you're coming in here and you just need better theology. You just need a different, you need to have your mind reframed because you're coming in here and you're tired or you're angry or you're nervous. And what the gospel does, it centers us on the work of Jesus. And so here's what Paul says to the church in Ephesus. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world. So before time even ever was, before there was chronos, he chose us in him to be what? To be holy and blameless in his sight. Now, you can think of salvation or the gospel in a number of ways, but look what Paul says here. He says, in love, he what? He predestined us for what? It's Orphan Sunday for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. And so the Bible tells us and frames salvation for us in a number of ways, but for, uh, for the purposes of this Sunday, I want us to go to the next slide. We can talk about being regenerated. That word in the Bible just means literally your heart was started, right? That, that, that literally your heart that was dead was it was like a generator and he regenerated he started your heart and he changed your heart so you could see right and the scales fell off he regenerated your heart once you are regenerated here's what happens when your heart is changed then you can what be justified how are you justified we just had reformation sunday a few sundays ago you're only justified through sola fide faith alone not by works at all so you are justified by Faith. Faith in what? In the works of Jesus Christ. And so that's what justified means. And then once you are justified, and maybe you come to a church and you, your heart is regenerated, you are justified, right? Um, you are reconciled as right, as true. Then he, you know, we also know that the Bible says, but he won't leave you there. He will sanctify you. And all that word means is he'll work on you. He will spiritually work on you. And he will continue to set you apart. He who began a good work will be faithful to complete it. He will sanctify you, and then finally, he will glorify you. In other words, that just means, do you believe in heaven? Do you believe that in one day you will have, uh, you will experience glorification? And that is one way of thinking about it. And we talk about that a whole lot, but there's a whole other idea that Paul knows resonates with a lot of us, because the holidays are coming up. Family. Family. Family matters, man relationships within the family and you as an orphan as a spiritual orphan you have been adopted it means everything listen to what he says in galatians this is galatians 4 4 and 5 but when the but, but when the set time had fully come god sent his son born of a woman born under the law to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship because you are his sons 
God sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, the Spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. Do you know that you now, if you know Christ, you have the right to call God Daddy? That's a privilege. You did not have that right to call Him Father. And if you know him and he has justified you and he is, you know, and, and you've been justified by faith, placing your faith in him, you now can, can walk into the presence of God with boldness and you can say, Daddy, oh boy, things are hard. Or, Daddy, you won't believe what I just did. You won't believe uh, what happened in my life. You are no longer a slave but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. Last one. This is Romans 8. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit that we get as a gift from salvation. You receive, you don't understand that. If you don't know Christ, you don't have this, but if you do know Christ, here's what you get. You get the Holy Spirit. And Paul is framing the Spirit here in Romans 8. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather... The spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by the spirit, we cry, Abba, Father. Here's the truth. Is that God, let's go to the next. God is the creator of all mankind, but God is not the father of all mankind. Only, no, only those that, that God has come and adopted, who He has predestined, right? He has adopted. Only those can call Him Daddy. The rest of mankind, all of mankind can call God Creator, Sustainer, Provider, but only those that God has set apart, only those uh, can call Him Father. What do you call Him? What would kind of reframing your adoption, your spiritual adoption that you've gone through, what might that do for you tomorrow? If you understand that you are not an orphan. One of my favorite, um, favorite movies growing up, because, is because I had three sisters, and I've talked about this before, is, right, it's a hard knock life for us. It's a hard knock life. It was, it was the orphan Annie. And the orphan Annie... <clears throat> And what you saw is you saw Miss Hannigan, who was just paid to be there. She wasn't a mother. She was a paid worker. And you saw all the orphans. And if you noticed, if, if you've ever watched that, and that was a long time ago, but there are two orphans, two of those girls. One, one girl was named Molly, and the other girl was named Pepper, right? And they were two orphan girls that acted in, in polar opposite ways. Molly needed Annie to come over and put her arm around her, right? And just be with her at night when she got scared or when she, you know, when, when there were bad guys around. Annie, could, because Molly was an orphan and she did not have a father that protected her. And so Molly engaged in a life of fear and maybe that's you. Maybe you're more the Molly. When you don't claim God is your father, you lean towards fear, and anxiety, and you live this life of, I'm just nervous, I'm constantly nervous. When I think of the term, uh, when I think of future, all I think is, oh my word, what's going to come next week, next month? And that, unfortunately, can bleed into what? Into relationships. And here's what happens. It's November, right? In a few weeks, we're having Thanksgiving. In another few weeks, we have Christmas. And what does, what does, what do the holidays do in our lives? I think they, they turn up the blessings and curses of families. They turn them up. So your greatest strengths are turned up and your greatest weaknesses are turned up. And here's what Paul is trying to tell the church in Rome, the church in Galatia, the church in Ephesus. Is you have to remember first and foremost that you now have God not as your creator but as your father. And what happens when you are in your house with a loving father. Here's what you know. If someone comes and knocks at the door, you don't have to worry because your dad's there. If, if there's a bill that comes in the mail, here's what you know. Your, your dad will pay that. It brings stability. It brings love. And some of us don't 
We forget it. I think it's just a memory issue for many of us. And we move into fear. Well, there's this other orphan named Pepper. And Pepper was strong and angry. <laughs> and she liked to take the mop and just hit, hit other girls with it. Um, and she had a kind of a loud, uh, kind of a loud, boisterous voice. And I think what she did, Pepper said, I don't have a father, just like Molly didn't have a father. But instead of entering into fear, I'm going to hedge everything and I'm going to stay strong. And I'm going to get angry. Because here's what anger does. When you feel angry a lot, here's what you know. You feel strong. Because anger is a strong, a strength emotion. And some of us enter into that. And Molly needs strength. But Pepper, she needs softness. A father who's there. And when you don't feel like you have to protect yourself, adoption tells you and me, hey, you can exhale. You can breathe you don't have to act out or be strong. You do not have to, you know, be cower in the corner. And some of us do that. We do one or the other. No, I'm going to be strong because I don't see God as my father. I see God as my creator. I don't want to think of him as daddy. That has too many, you know, weird connotations. And what Paul is trying to tell you and me is that, hey, he is your dad. When you understand, right? John says this. In 1 John 3, see what great love the Father has lavished on us that we shall be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. You can't know me if you don't know my dad. You cannot know me. Do you know what those that don't know the Lord were called? They either were called children of the flesh, children of the world, or they were called, literally, they were called children of of the devil. In other words, who is the father of this world? It's, the, it's Satan. It's Beelzebub. You know, that's what the scriptures teach us. And so if you don't have God, Yahweh, Jehovah Jireh, my provider, as what? As your father, um, then you uh, won't understand. And so you think about it. Okay, so, so what, Frank? What does it look like? What does it look like not to be scared and not to be too strong? Because here's my life. I go, to, I go from fear to anger, to fear to anger. When I get too angry, then I get soft and I believe and I try to reach out. But then I just, I feel like I end up insecure. But I think here's what we have to do. We have to stare at our brother, if you will. We have to stare at Matthew 3. Because remember, Jesus was born, and he had not started his ministry until he's 30 years old. He only had three years of professional ministry. And here's what happens. He does, you know, the whole Christmas story is told, John the Baptist is told, in the Gospel of Matthew, he hasn't preached a sermon yet. He hasn't healed anybody. Here's what happens right before he starts his ministry. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son. This is my Son, with whom I love. With, with him I am well pleased. Here's what we do. We stare at the perfect brother, our brother Jesus who had the perfect father, and he was the perfect son. Because here's what we know about Jesus. Jesus is the only son, it, it, scripturally. Christ is the only, should, oh, it, only one. I forgot a word there, guys. That's awkward. <laughs> it's the only one. Is the only son who was what? At least according to scripture, spiritually, who wasn't adopted. Because he had always been. He's begotten of the father. There wasn't a time when Jesus ever wasn't. That's, that's, how, how per, that's the perfect harmony, right? Remember Ge uh, Genesis 128. Let us, the Trinity, the dance of the Trinity, let us make man in our own image. Out of that, he is, he is the secure brother. He is the brother that we stare at and we say, you know what? Here's what I can't lose. I can't lose my father. And here's what I need to stare at. I need to stare at healthy in this, in this case, perfect father-son relationships. 
Because the father, what did he, or the son always did what to the father? He submitted. He says, no, I'll do whatever you want. In fact, he double checks with his father in the Garden of Gethsemane. <laughs> father, I don't really want to do this. I do not want to drink of this cup. If there's any way, Dad, that you can remove this cup, but it's always about your will, because here's what I do. I always trust you, because you're my dad, and you've never, ever let me down. Are you adopted? Or do you live like the strong, angry orphan or the fearful, nervous orphan? Is it Molly or is it Pepper? I got to watch a, just, for, just in case you guys didn't know, I like sports. Oh, okay, so you guys knew that, right, okay, yeah. Uh, um, some of us feel fatherless without a head coach, too. You know, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. That's a Florida State joke for all those, yeah, whatever. Um, so I was watching this little 30 on 30, and it was the story of one Dennis Rodman. And it was the story of him without a family, is really what it was. And how he was living on the streets, and he's 18, and he's 19, and he's 20 years old, and this coach in southeast Oklahoma takes a chance on him. And this family brings him into his house, and he starts playing like you wouldn't believe. And all he could talk about was this, this, kind of, this, this uh, couple and their son that brought him in, because he'd never been really a part of a functional home. And he played, and all of a sudden, basketball, it, it all clicked. And next thing you know, he's a three-time All-American in a very small division in basketball. But the NBA uh, scouts saw him, and they said, oh, this guy can have a place. And then he starts talking about being on the Detroit Pistons in the mid to late uh, 80s and then the early 90s. And here's, and, and here's what you saw. You saw Dennis Rodman just completely attach himself to Chuck Daly, his head coach. It utterly changed his life. He was free. He was the, the, uh, the piston of all pistons. He would dive after any ball, whatever Chuck Daly told him to do, because he felt the love of his head coach that obviously you saw as he saw as a father and how it changed him. Right? And how it was, you know, if we're going to be the bad boys, then I'm going to be the baddest of all bad boys. But here's what happens. They won two championships, and it begins to decline. Some of his buddies go to different teams. And then Chuck Daly um, resigns as head coach. Some of you know Dennis Rodman and his, kind of his antics. That's the moment he said it changed. Are you, I did not have a family anymore. I did not have Chuck as my head coach, and then I went to San Antonio, and then you know what I did? I started acting out like an orphan. So you know what I did? I painted my hair all kinds of crazy, crazy colors. He became insecure, and he went to anger, and then he would go to sadness, and you see it. You could see it in his life. He didn't understand what it meant to be a part of a family, and I'm wondering for you if you understand that. What would it mean for you to spiritually this morning really enter into your adoption and to have a not an earthly father but a spiritual father that loves you unconditionally how might that change your monday how might that change the way you look at your husband or the way you look at your wife or the way you look at your kid or the way you look at your father i think it would transform it because this is this is security right and yeah, I may get soft and scared sometimes, but dad's there. And yeah, I might get self-righteous and angry and brash, but dad's there and he'll put me in line. Because that's what a good dad does. That's what a good mom does. That's what good parents do. And that's what the church was supposed to identify as. We're an adopted people. Have you ever, ever entered into that? Saw the gospel as freedom, but freedom that comes from having a father who loves you no matter what. We adhere to the Westminster Confession of Faith, and there's this one chapter, little paragraph that we have on adoption. And I love what it says, because here's what it says. It says, um, we are made partakers of the grace of adoption. We are taken into a number, 
We enjoy the liberties and privileges of the children of God. We have His name put upon us. We receive the spirit of adoption. Then it says we have access to the throne room of grace with boldness, and we are enabled to cry out, Abba, Father. And then it says, and, and, and here are some blessings that it says comes from being um, in the family, from living in a spiritual house where God our Father uh, is the head, Jesus is, is our loving, perfect brother. Here's what it says. Here's, here's, what we, here's what God will do if you will let him. If you'll let him be a father, here's what he promises. He says this, As a father has compassion on his children, so... The Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Some of you need a father who empathizes with you. You need a, a dad who's, who's free enough to say, you know what, this is hard. You had your heart broken, baby girl. You were in that relationship, and I think maybe you gave your entire self to that dude, and it wasn't time. But you know what, it's okay. And your heart is broken, but I'm here. You come to me. And that's a father who has compassion on his children. The Lord has compassion on us. And so part of the blessing, if, if, I'm, if I'm giving a sales pitch for the adoption, for you being adopted into the family of God, is what you receive. You receive compassion. That's what the, the scriptures say. You will receive compassion. What else will you get? Whoever fears the Lord has a secure fortress. And for their children, it will be a refuge. Not only will you get compassion, but you'll get protection. Right? How? Well, you're protected from fear of the future. You're protected from the fear of death that many of us are. We're just scared of dying. Let, let me protect you from that. Let me tell you, I'm an eternal father who, who has begotten an eternal son. And you know what? Once you're united to him, you do not. You have security in the future. And if you don't know Jesus, I know this sounds crazy. I know this sounds nuts, that there is an eternal life. Some of you only believe in the temporal. You only believe in an, in an enlightened world, a scientific, logical, empiricist world. I, 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 um, as long as I can perceive it, as long as I can touch it, then it's real. But all this supernatural craziness, that's not. Well, it's going to take faith. But we believe a blessing like this, fearing the Lord, when you fear him in, in a way that you revere him, you revere your father, he what? He protects you. He says, look, here's what I'm going to do. Your brother, Jesus, is going to go up. He's going to go up to heaven. He's going to prepare a place for you. Like, literally. He's going to prepare a place for you to live. You want security? You know, you like apples? Those are, how about them apples? That's good stuff. What else? Not only does he give you compassion, not only does he give you uh, protection... But here, here's, this is Matthew 6, 30, uh, 30 and 31. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? He says, look, if you come and know God is your father, you will not just be protected. You will not just get empathy. You will receive provision. He will provide for you. He does that every single time to, to the people of Israel. As, as much as they sin, as much as they turn their backs, God said, no, no. Here's how I'm going to provide. I'm only going to make it last for one day. But literally every day, manna will drop from heaven when you're in the desert. And if you try to store it up for more than one day, it, won't, it, it will go bad. So here's what you have to learn to do, Israel. Every single day you come to me. Every day. Because this goes bad if you don't eat it today. It won't last if you put it in the refrigerator, right? It won't. <laughs> he says, I want to teach you how much I will provide. And every day, manna came. Whenever they needed water, even if it needed to come from a rock, he provided. And so we know a, a good father has empathy. A good father protects. A good father um, provides and this is a tougher one. But all, a good father also does this in Romans or Hebrews 12. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? A good father disciplines. 
if you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of spirits and live? They disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Here's what a good father does. A good father disciplines us. Right? It's love. What's good parenting? Love, lots of love, and lots of limits. That's good parenting right there. And part of what some of you don't want, you don't want reins. You do not want fences in your life. And you know what? Christianity has those. And you know who built those fences? Your father. Because he knows where it's safe to go and he knows where it's dangerous to go. And so he, build, he builds fences and says, do not go on the other side of that fence. And you and I, we get angry with that. No, no. Come on, you say, do I want freedom? Come on, it's for freedom, right? That means I, I should be able to do whatever I want. No, that's not Christianity's definition of freedom. Freedom is being a son and to come under the rule and the reign of your loving father. Are you okay with being disciplined as a Christian? Because some of you need it. I know I need it at times. I need to, I, I need whatever part of my life to be uh, um, spanked, <laughs> right? To be, to be disciplined. You know, you, it says all throughout the script, if you spare the rod, you spoil the child. And I know that has ramifications obviously we don't want to hurt anyone physically and, and you know cause undue unnecessary damage but when we are disciplined here's what it does is it forces us you know what parenting was in the old testament if you read the old testament hebrew parenting literally, discipline means this the removal of options right so as a parent here's what you say to your kid you do not have options anymore that's the biblical way to parent and that's what god our loving father says to us at times I'm going to remove options. You have to do this. And you know what? If we don't buck it, if we don't, you know, it produces in us a perseverance, Paul or a James says, uh, that um, will last eternally. So where are you this morning? What does it mean for you to believe in a father that provides and protects, that disciplines you, because sometimes when we feel discipline coming, we're thinking, well, then could he just cut? He, could he cut bait here and just leave me? No. He promises he will never, ever leave you. You always have a room in his house. What if that was your reframing the Sabbath? What if that were, were the mindset you have? I'm an adopted son. I'm, I am not because, you know what, maybe you're acting, maybe I'm acting like an orphan. And I'm either cowering in fear or I'm bowing up in strength or in anger that, I, that is just not real and what, what adoption does is it centers us on the love of God our Father ultimately pointing us to the love that he gave us through the person of Jesus Christ when we understand that I think what Meredith said is true we will experience freedom and I think that's offered to a number of you this morning so let me do this let me pray and let me ask God to work in